longevity lifestyle designer says so govern your secrets of longevity.com. Most religious and or spiritual traditions have some sort of framework within them that describes a constructive as well as a destructive force. Whether this takes the form of certain deities like gods and goddesses that represent them or in some cases it's actually like a universal force that represents these things. And what we have to acknowledge is that this sort of abstract concept has a reflection in the real world and in our bodies and our health. And the way this looks is that if we look at any person who's teaching about health, generally those who are the most successful in teaching it accept that there's these different cycles that we go through on our pursuit of increased overall health, maintaining homeostasis, getting into balance, and just being all around vibrant beings. So if we take exercise for example, we have the catabolic action of breaking down muscle tissue, uh, breaking down uh, more of the internal type tissues if we're looking at more of the more internal type practices like Qigong. And it's done in very subtle ways. You're not tearing things, you're not causing permanent damage, but just enough, a small amount, so that your body starts to repair itself and it grows back stronger. It rebuilds and you get denser muscles, more muscle mass, uh, healthier organs, in some cases healthier ligaments and tendons. And on the nutritional side of things we have fasting and feasting. Uh, this could be simply just your fastest while you sleep and then you eat your three square meals a day. But in some situations we might want a more dramatic approach where you fast for a certain period of time. If you're trying to address certain key issues that can benefit from that. Other times you might want to be feasting a little more to help rebuild uh, from something that caused you uh, too much damage, too much catabolism in the past. So a very basic understanding of this principle or a very basic uh, representation or metaphor for this is that we have expansion and contraction in our lives. This is uh, construction and destruction. One's not bad, one's not good. They're both necessary for life. And any system, in my opinion, that overemphasizes one compared to the other, you're going to run into problems in the long term. So whether it's a spiritual tradition that's constantly emphasizing expansion, 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 and ascension, and you see these people, they're not very grounded. They're very spacey, airy-fairy. They often lack uh, an understanding of the basic human mentality and what it means to be whole, present here, right now, in this day. Then if you look to certain nutritional paradigms you have, uh, in one extreme you might have certain parts of raw veganism which overemphasizes catabolism or uh, cleansing too much so that people wait, start wasting away and they lose bone density, muscle mass, uh, their stores of various essential fat soluble nutrients. Then on the other end of the spectrum you have the overfeasting of things like the mainstream bodybuilding paradigm where they're consuming way too much protein, they're eating very much a sort of junk food type diet because they're trying to eat like seven, eight, nine thousand calories a day, but it's taking the form of cheap food, low quality food, and you know, their whole day from the moment of waking up to when they fall asleep. In some cases the top bodybuilders that are just gross and how bloated they look. They're actually waking up in the middle of the night to eat, so they're, they're not giving their body any rest to cleanse. Uh, what we see the most healthy systems, obviously, are the ones that find an equilibrium. They have that middle path approach. They come down and have that balanced expansion and contraction, uh, feasting and fasting, breaking down and building up. So what this video is actually about, and this introduction is definitely part of it, it's setting the framework so that you can understand this slightly controversial topic is that certain herbs and things that we consume have elements in them that some people try to label as poisons and that we should never touch them. What we know is that a lot of herbs, whether they're the most tonifying herbs which are the closest to foods, meaning we could consume them every day with very little toxic buildup, uh, they even have small amounts of alkaloids and things like that. But then if we go to the other extreme, so if you think of herbalism as an extreme of the most uh, harmless in terms of being able to take any dose and take it as much as you want, and on the other hand you have herbs that are extremely dose specific and you do not want to overindulge, you do not want to take them for too long daily, 
uh, because they'll have negative side effects for obvious reasons. And then, of course, there's herbs that are somewhere in between. And these properties in these things uh, are what affect our body in beneficial ways. So different tiny properties that we consume will tonify certain organ systems. They actually are a little harsh on the organ system. Not in any way that's permanently damaging unless you don't follow the uh, directions and dosage and things like that, or if you're not working with a qualified practitioner. And then our organ kind of bounces back and rebuilds and gets stronger as a result. Now what gets complicated here is that people have unique constitutions. And this means that one thing that can be great for one person that might, if they took it daily, give them extreme longevity, and another person that could kill them in just a matter of decades. You see this with things like tobacco. I've done a video in the recent past, which you can check out here, where I look at this controversial topic. And you know, a lot of the longest lived people in the world often have these strange vices, and it confuses people. The mainstream health community is really quite puritanical when you've had enough of an experience observing it from the outside, or even from the inside, and you've directly experienced it. And what we can learn from this is that humans are not as simple as some of these ideologies like to make us think. Certain amounts of certain vice type foods or drugs or herbs can have a beneficial effect and they have their right place and right time and again that's going to vary depending on the individual. So this is by no means scientific saying that you know that long-lived person did that thing or that long-lived person didn't do that thing. Those are just individual examples but they can pique our interest and curiosity into delving into this whole topic a little more. If we look at all indigenous cultures, we're not talking about post-agriculture cultures because there was a lot of post-agricultural cultures that developed things like religions which were puritanical. Puritanicism didn't exist until these societies started to crop up and taught these very anti-body, anti-being uh, alive on this planet type uh, belief systems. But if we go to indigenous cultures, virtually everyone that had access to them would use various types of vices or herbs, essentially. I'm not talking about uh, going out and smoking meth. I'm talking about herbs that had effects that they could get from their environment, and they would use them regularly to some extent, or more sporadically. And they could be stimulatory, they could be hallucinatory, they could be depressant, not in terms of making you depressed, but more like a relaxant. They could have been uh, inebriating, like various types of alcohol that would be made by a lot of these indigenous cultures. Or they could even be what would be called a very sharp toxin or strong toxin that was profoundly anti-parasitic, would be used in certain doses uh, to basically flush out the system. So the name The Poison Path, which has been used to describe um, witchcraft and more pagan type beliefs in some cases, uh, it was also used quite a bit, or sort of popularized by a book, which was popularized by a book by Dale Pendle called Pharmacopoeia, or ph Pharmacopoeia, with a slash in between. You can see it on the screen here if you want to go have a look at it online. And it's unique in that it classifies uh, some of these more vice-like herbs into these different categories. And it also describes sort of um, elemental and planetary energies or associations with that. So if you're into that kind of thing and can get an understanding and uh, look at it this way, it can be quite interesting, the connections that this author's made. I'll throw the picture up on the screen, but also stick a link in the drop-down menu below if you want to go look at this picture more close up. I don't know how well it's going to turn out on the screen. And essentially what you see is five categories. You have Thanatopathia, which in that diagram, some of these are Latin names, so you'd have to look them up if you want to uh, get it from understanding the image separately. But there's, in that category, there's tobacco and absinthe. And this uh, section is highlighted by the energy of Saturn, uh, would be the uh, element Aether or Akasha. And these are herbs that have unique compounds in them that are profoundly anti-parasitic. So they have a role, they have a profound impact on the body in terms of almost being like a mini 
nuclear holocaust on things you know, which probably shouldn't be there in some cases. And of course that can be beneficial for our health. Small amounts of a poison can elicit a healing response. The section Inebriantia is governed by Jupiter. That would be sort of like the element of Earth. And it includes uh, grapes or alcohol essentially. Uh, alcohol made from grapes as well as kava kava. And as you can ascertain, these are substances that would elicit uh, more social behavior, breaks down barriers, lets people connect, and is also very relaxing. Um, alcohol itself would be classified as a depressant, but I wouldn't call kava kava that. It is very relaxing, but also has a stimulatory effect on the mind. And I'll talk about kava kava more after I've gone through these five categories. Then you have euphorica, which would be uh, the planet Venus, and this would be likened to the element of water. It's very feminine. And you have opium on the outside there, and on the inside you have salvia. Both very feminine plants with feminine energies. I shouldn't have to mention this, but obviously anything I'm talking about here or that is listed here that is an illegal substance, you do not want to be imbibing upon it if it's illegal in your area. And some of these are also very dangerous, so, you know, 18 or over, don't even think about messing with any of these things. We're talking about very delicate things to be using with a lot of wisdom, a lot of care, a lot of attention. So if we look at medical model, there are applications for the use of opiates. There's also obviously a lot of people that get addicted to these, they're very harsh. And interestingly, salvia has been used to help those types of addictions, addictions to other things as well. And it kind of snaps you out of that frame of being addicted to that thing and really gets you to re-examine your life. The next section is Fantastica, which includes a lot of hallucinogens. You have uh, MDMA listed there. You have uh, psilocybin mushrooms, uh, Yage, and a lot of these things that would go into that category. And by the way, all these categories would fit a lot more than just the things listed. Uh, obviously, MDMA is not a natural occurring substance, so I would personally not put it on this whole map. Um, but that gives you an idea of the element of mercury or air, of what these things can affect. And there's actually a lot of research, more and more coming out now, that uh, a lot of hallucinogens can be extremely beneficial for the health, very beneficial for people uh, who are in the process of dying. People with really unique cases of headaches, migraine headaches or cluster headaches can benefit from the use of psilocybin mushrooms. Uh, you can check out this video here which will take you to a video that describes how these mushrooms, which by the way are illegal, so don't imbibe them if you're illegal where you are, and it's actually been found to increase the growth of brain cells and new brain tissue. So that's really remarkable in my opinion. And even though there's not specific studies showing, you know, this thing can cause greater lifespan in mice or even in humans, we can understand that if you're improving something to that degree, it's going to be beneficial for your overall being, which is why I'm making this video. And lastly, Excitantia, which is governed by Mars. It's a very masculine, fiery energy, and also the element of fire. It includes a lot of stimulants. Coffee, coca leaf, green tea. I'd also put chocolate, raw chocolate, in this category. And these things have their place. They're obviously not for everyone, uh, but a lot of people have found greater productivity through the use of these uh, stimulating compounds. There's more and more studies coming out every day showing the benefits of a lot of these and dismissing and refuting the past conclusions of them being damaging. So all in all we see this interesting um, picture of these different categories, different effects from these things that are in them. I am by no means saying that anyone should consume any of these or even a wide range of these. Again, it really depends on your unique position in life, what you could get out of these, what could be damaging from these, if you had past addictions to any of these things, or just an addictive personality in general, or if you have the likelihood of just abusing it because you're at an immature point in your life. So these substances that have their beneficial effects on the body, on our health, when some of them are used in very controlled ways, are easily abused, are well known in our culture to be misused and abused by a lot of people. And we'll just briefly talk about the different ways in that, which that often happens. 
So opiates, obviously people get addicted to these. Uh, they are just in a place in life where they can't handle anything anymore. And it's an escapism. It's a way to get a pleasurable feeling when nothing in their life is giving them pleasure. A lot of this sometimes can stem from someone getting into an accident, having pain, getting stuck on pain medication. That's the more medical rep. And then there's also people getting addicted to heroin in the past. Uh, it was the more unrefined form of opium. And really this is one of the more, more controversial things on the list because the only healthy application of this in my opinion is if you were in a crisis scenario where you needed it to calm pain because you were in a horrific accident, you had some sort of injury, and that should be done through uh, obviously the medical model when that's appropriate. If we were to look at the youth of today, they often engage in things that are uh, almost like, as I mentioned before, escapist type attractions to psychedelics. And the excessive use of them can obviously lead to all sorts of aberrations in mental thinking. Personally, that was a vice of mine in my youth, overuse of a variety of things that would fall under this category that uh, really created an unstable point of view that I had for the world. And that would be something that is, can be very detrimental. And if you are a younger person watching this, steer clear of these things until you're very mature. Obviously, we see the overuse of various types of stimulants in people who want to be more productive in the workplace, or they just don't have enough sleep in their life, or there's something missing nutritionally that causes them to be very tired all the time, and so they turn to coffee, tea, energy drinks, all these things that are obviously damaging when used to excess, when used too regularly. Next, we have the use of the synthetic or unpure versions of these herbs, or even over-purified versions of them. So, you know, you have a pharmacological industrial complex that uh, takes things and creates drugs out of them which can cause problems. You have things like energy drinks which compared to coffee are horrendous for your health big time from the excess caffeine from all the other junk that's added to it. Then you have big tobacco which obviously in that video that I had up on the screen earlier uh, really causes horrendous issues with uh, all the additives uh, the way in which the tobacco is grown, the hybridization of it, the way it's cured, all these compound on top of what before it wasn't a very harmful plant at all and makes it one of the biggest killers of our time today. And of course you have unhealthy forms of alcohol and the unhealthy use of alcohol as an escapist type thing. You have the criminal involvement with all these things that uh, obviously that's unhealthy to be around or be involved with. But essentially, if we have the wisdom and ability to perceive that these are all the imbalanced forms of these very specialized substances and herbs that need a lot of respect and you need to approach them with a lot of wisdom. So I'm just going to talk about a few here that I've used either in the past or even more recently and how they've impacted my life in beneficial ways. As with all herbs, you need to perceive them as tools. So for example, chocolate. If I consume chocolate in large quantities every single day, I run into problems. But it is something that I can consume fairly regularly, uh, but naturally I fall into a place of consuming it and going off and on it just intuitively. I don't even have to think about it. I might have been addicted to it slightly at first when I first got into raw chocolate, then I went through a long period of not touching it at all, and then I found a good balance point. And, you know, it's chock full of antioxidants, there's all sorts of benefits from chocolate, raw chocolate, dark chocolate, and there's no reason if it works for you, because there's definitely people that can't use any of it at all, there's some people that can consume it every day, uh, then that can be a great thing to use. Things like salvia and a lot of these other psychedelics can elicit really positive experiences, or on the other end of the spectrum you can have really horrendous experiences, but they can be life-changing. Uh, a lot of people that overuse these types of things, they're just looking for an experience because they're bored in life, uh, but personally, once in a blue moon I might use something like salvia to elicit some sort of change in my life. I generally need a very specific type of setting for it to be uh, beneficial and there's a lot of intention that goes into it, a lot of preparation and it can be mind-opening in that it will help me see certain things in my life that I couldn't see in the everyday frame of mind that we go through life in. Same thing with other types of hallucinogens, I'm not going to list off a lot but legal, another legal one in most uh, industrialized nations is Amanitas muscaria. Definitely don't recommend picking it yourself unless you are very well versed in mycology because there's some very poisonous things and species of mushrooms that look similar.
but a lot of people that have used it or might have one extremely profound experience from it, from taking the right type of dosage, have their lives completely changed around. I had the unique experience of using this when I was younger, uh, not too far back, but it had a profound effect on shaping my worldview, my inner uh, comprehension and experience of life, and I, I carry that beneficial outcome with me today. It's something that I highly value. If you take something like kava kava, it's a very unique herb. Uh, it can be very beneficial for people who have trouble sleeping in terms of getting them into that state of extreme relaxation. It's a very profound muscle relaxant. It is unique in that it maintains mental alertness and gives you a bit of focus. Uh, but you generally don't want to try and use it in that way as a way of being productive because it generally makes you more social. It's similar to the effects of alcohol just without the dizziness and inebriation but it's also different in other ways. This is something more recent that I've been experimenting with and Brandon over at Hyperion Herbs recently started carrying it. I've got a link below if you want to go check out his page that has it, a really great extract of it but also has a lot of good information on it. Uh, there's a lot of misinformation out there unfortunately about Kava Kava and you can learn more about that if uh, it's piques your interest. I'll probably do a more specific video on that in the near future as well. You've also heard me talk about alcohol and its uh, application and place in a healthy lifestyle for some people, not everyone, but a lot of people it can be great. And then getting back again to that one topic of tobacco and absinthe, but being in that same category of being profoundly anti-parasitic, that's just yet another example of these things that in the past or in some cases are blacklisted, said to be completely horrendous for your health or make you go crazy but they have some really specific health benefits. And with our modern understanding of science and these things, we can better understand their application and how they could be used as tools to further our health. So if you've made it this far, congratulations. You have an open mind. Uh, obviously the title is pretty controversial sounding, but you probably have guessed from this video. It's very applicable and basic information that hopefully helps you in some way. So let me know what you think about this video in the comments below. Check out the links below the video, and if you feel so inclined, share and rate the video. And with that, I'll talk to you next time. Take care and embrace life without limits.